All right. Welcome, everybody. looks like we're on live now. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Toby Miller right here again, Vice President for AMS. And thanks again so much for taking this time out of your schedule to work on your business rather than just working in your business, right? I think I say this every time we get together, but one of the critical skills that we all learn uh, in the martial arts and we, we learn while we're mastering our physical art is this concept of sort of stepping back from the fight or stepping back from, from the engagement to be able to gain some perspective. And this is something I think that, that's critically important to running a successful martial arts business or really any, any business of any type that you get some perspective, right? You, you take time to work on the systems and work on the business rather than, than uh, just working in the business. So I, I appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to do this today uh, with us. Um, a couple quick logistics, if you could, uh, if you can hear me okay, just hit the little like button or give me a thumbs up or something and make sure that I, I see green dots over here. So I'm assuming that you can hear me okay. So uh, give me a give me a share there if that if that helps. Um, today, I, I'm absolutely honored to be chatting with our guest today. Um, uh, one of the things I think that really makes a big impact in my life in, in training in martial arts and operating successful schools and, and helping other martial artists accomplish the same thing is this idea of you know, turning your passion into your profession. And our guest today is really sort of, in my view, sort of the, the seminal uh, example of that. Uh, Anshu Stephen Hayes has lived what I would consider to be the ultimate martial arts lifestyle. Uh, obviously starting his train. I, I think everybody uh, attending, sir, probably knows your history a fair bit, but let me quickly encapsulate if I could. Um, starting obviously in the, in, in the 70s. And actually interesting, sir, we share a bit of a common thread. I'm a Tong Sudo guy. Oh yeah, and I, huh. I, and, and I stumble across the fact that uh, you started kind of your martial arts journey with dabbling a little bit of Tong Sudo. Is that right? That's right. Back in the 1960s. <laughs> so uh, starting in the 60s, and then obviously pursuing your martial arts training in Japan in the 70s, um, coming back to the United States, writing a whole litany of books about the ninja art in the 80s, um, and e even you know becoming this personal security attache for the Dalai Lama for many years. Uh, uh, you've, you've done TED Talks, Discovery Channel, television shows, uh, and you've been, I think, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think you've been on the cover of Black Belt Magazine more than anybody except Bruce Lee, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> I was just talking to Cheryl Angel Hart a, a, few, a few months ago about that. And that was her claim, so I'm, I'm assuming that that's true. Um, but, sir, thank you so much for taking time today. Today we're not talking about specifically martial arts, but we're talking about how the skills of developing your martial art translate into running very successful martial arts schools. So, uh, sir, it's my honor. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Oh, it's great to be here, Toby. Uh, look, let's see what we can do here for folks. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I, I, I think I, I've said this many times. I'm not sure if, you know, any of our listeners may remember, but uh, Anshu Hayes is, again, not just, you know, a great example of the martial arts, living the ultimate martial arts lifestyle, but really one of my favorite human beings on the planet, right? I mean, when it comes to contributing back to the martial arts, and I mean, I, I don't know if I ever look around and I don't see, you know, Anshu Hayes helping school operator, you know, helping martial artists learn, uh, you know, in seminars and in New Jersey at Alan Goldberg's event or at Century's event or whatever the case is, I, I always see you, you know, contributing to the martial arts industry and contributing back, you know, what you've learned and, and helping other folks. So I, I respect that so greatly, sir. And I, I really appreciate all that. Um, let's start with something that you said the other day that I think is really important for uh, our school operator uh, listeners to understand. I think you, you described sort of this, um, in the martial arts, there are some folks who think in order to be successful financially, you must have in some way, you know, sold out or in some way, uh, you know, sacrifice the integrity of your art or whatever the case is in order to be more profitable. And, and you described a concept of just this idea of living with dignity and this idea of so much abundance in the universe and in, 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 in uh, with the opportunity that we have to serve other people and creating this uh, turning your passion into a profession, you know, where might you take that? If, if I were a school operator and maybe that's in my head, maybe I, I've come from this almost a poverty mindset, right? Um, how would you maybe address that? And, and what would you, what perspective would you take on that? Oh, you know, that's quite a long discussion. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, seriously, it really haunts uh, so many people's operation, they get in their mind, oh, we shouldn't charge money. This is martial arts. And, you know, I would very patiently 
advise them. I said, oh, that's interesting. You know, uh, martial arts is so important and so crucial to people that you shouldn't charge any money or just charge a little teeny money. And yeah, yeah. I said, well, how about if you were in the world and, you're, and you needed a heart operation and you were going to go to the best possible hospital for heart care, wherever that would be, do you think they'd be charging you $25? Uh, no, no, you'd have to you'd have to pay for the best health care. And uh, if you wanted to go uh, to a university, let's say, oh, man, you set your sights on the top university. You want to go to Harvard. Would you pay $25 to go to Harvard? Uh, and, and, you know, ironically, uh, with uh, health concerns in mind, you know, to buy the best quality food, organically raised vegetables and meats, uh, that's actually more expensive than the conventional food. So there again, you're spending more money. So we could go on and on with this. Um, the point being that it's recognized in every uh, situation, you got to spend to get the best, it, except for the martial arts. <laughs> Uh, except for the martial arts. So, you know, that might help bring some people along. I understand this poverty mentality. I don't know. I think that possibly it's an excuse. Maybe I'm not as good an instructor as I thought I was. Maybe my martial art doesn't have as much to offer as I thought it did. I'm just dogged in my pursuit and I'm just real loyal and I don't have many students because I'm not that good an instructor and my martial art isn't that impressive. I'm not going to take responsibility. I, I run into nobody who says, well, you know, I'm a pretty mediocre teacher. <laughs> Everybody thinks they're a great teacher. You know, uh, uh, nobody says, nah, I'm pretty mediocre, but I just do what I like to do. Um, so maybe it's kind of an excuse. Maybe it's kind of an excuse. I turn it around and say, oh, I'm not interested in commercialism. I want a few students and uh, I don't care about the money. Uh, sounds so noble. But is it the truth? Is it the truth? Yeah, yeah. I, I you know, this is some deep head stuff, right? And, and I, I think this gets wired in really early in life. And, and I think most of us, you know, most folks who, who own martial arts schools, who operate martial arts schools, you know, we grew up and maybe we didn't have a lot of money and, and maybe we only paid 25 or 30 or $40 a month or whatever the case is. Is that, does that seem right? You know, I think you really are on to something there. I never thought about that before, but I think you're on to something. Um, tennis, golf, you know, these are like upper class activities. I mean, generally, generally speaking, uh, martial arts, Mm, not so much the high class. And I had a person point out to you one time, he says, well, take a look through the golf magazine and uh, martial art magazine and look at who advertises. Sure. Oh, God. sure. Golf magazine, you got Porsche advertising, uh, uh, Breitling watches and, you know, great scotches. And you look through martial art magazine and saw these companies with animal names on it, you know. Oh gosh, you know, that's kind of, was kind of embarrassing to me, but you know, I think maybe a lot of us came in with this poverty mentality an idea that oh, some people are lucky. Some are lucky and they have a great lifestyle. I'm not so lucky. Well, you can create luck. It's a skill you can learn if you're willing to set aside an emotional bias against prosperity and you're willing to kind of empty your cup and just look at, hey, look at the guys who are successful. What do they do? And, and in fact, be honest. Have these uh, guys who are successful, have they given up? Um, are they teaching watered down martial arts? Are they teaching uh, little thrown together, you know, uh, systems? I don't think so. I don't think so, personally. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe that is that background. Uh, but, but boy, isn't that something? Isn't that quite the challenge to give that up? You know, to say I spent 20 some years 
believing in luck and other people have it made. And we can even find on social media, we can even find proof of that. Well, look at like the Kardashians. You know, they just created this multi-million dollar thing. Or look at uh, uh, Nicki Minaj. You know, look at, we can find rare examples of people who came from nothing and became multi, multi-millionaires with negligible stuff to offer. Um, and and that, that seals it in. See, it's all luck. It's all luck. And we don't look around, you know, at the uh, millionaire next door. Uh, uh, pizza, I just saw yesterday, there's a, a person uh, who uh, has a small chain of pizza restaurants in Dayton and uh, like nine restaurants. Um, earned $21 million last year with just a couple of these pizza restaurants. Oh, talk to that guy. You know, I mean, he's the guy who just started with some dough and cheese and uh, uh, he's going to tell you about luck. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. There's so many of those stories that we overlook um, that can become a habit. Oh yeah, I'm a, a, a poverty case and therefore I attract poverty people and uh, um, so I put poverty poverty prices on my service. Yeah, it, it can definitely be a self-fulfilling prophecy. And, and I think, you know, you, you describe, you mentioned this by the way, but let me just kind of unpack it a little bit more. You know, th- there also becomes sort of the psychological baggage that comes along with being a premium product or premium service or premium pricer. You now have higher expectations in the marketplace. So now, you know, the parent who comes in for lessons or, or the adult who comes in for lessons, their expectations are, well, if I'm paying Harvard tuition, but I'm only getting community college classes, we've got a, our community college service. We've got a problem here. So, so let me, let me, if I could, let me drill into that for you and with you. Uh, for our audience who may not know, um, not only you know living what I would again call the ultimate martial arts lifestyle, uh, but uh, Anshu Hayes, uh, you know, was responsible for 31 locations, uh, 31 schools in the U.S. and in, in like four other countries, five other countries. So he knows a little bit about running multiple locations and a little bit about influencing the leaders, in- influencing other leaders, executive leadership skills uh, to help other school operators raise their standards and, and produce a higher quality product, have higher expectations for themselves and their, fa- and their families and their students. Um, and so I, th- I think part of that is what we're describing, right? So h- how do you, in your multi-location environment, um, um, we're working with these folks that you're on a quest to sort of raise the expectations and raise the standards of your people. And you would describe that, that, that goes all the way down to decor and layout and things like that. So w- what are you focused on that right now? Well, uh, I think, uh, certainly the decor, uh, is a crucial, element if you're again if you're aiming at upper income people these are people who maybe go to a country club uh, their dentist office that they go to is uh, is beautiful um uh where they work maybe nice and 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 then they come to your martial arts school and it's just a empty room with a couple of mats and white walls and a couple of slogans painted on the walls whoa whoa whoa, whoa. what this is not what I'm used to. Uh, and so it can set up a disconnect already with the, uh, with the person. So our training hall is, uh, you know, we have it painted in, in maroon and uh, kind of a deep gold with green walls in certain areas. It's very colorful, lots of wood. Um, there's a traditional now, this is controversial, but there's a traditional Japanese shrine, you know, kind of like this here. I, I'm in my house dojo right now. This isn't my city dojo. This is my private house dojo. And, uh, you know, some people say, well, gosh, you know, you got a shrine up there. Doesn't that offend Christians or, uh, you know, humanists? Or said, No, we just explain it. It's like the mantle at your grandma's house. You know, you got picture of granddad up there and a couple of souvenirs and maybe your diploma. And, uh, uh, you know, people accept that. 
but you've got to you've got to set up your place and by all means get rid of the folding chairs oh. <laughs> you know, i see <laughs> but that that's an expectation thing you know uh, well we had folding chairs in my place uh when i was learning yeah but you you learned in a crummy little basement uh you know from a hobbyist get rid of the folding chairs it doesn't cost that much more money to buy nice uh padded chairs and uh i'm kind of controversial and i say you know get rid of the droopy flags you know droopy american flag droopy korean flag you know put them on a pole in a corner if you have to have a flag put it on a pole in the corner um that flag business started back in the 70s when you know japanese or uh, maybe in the 60s when japanese started their school 70s when the koreans came in they had an exotic asian thing here in good old america you know and so they said no no i'm american i'm american so i put a big american flag up you know just to counterbalance that and most of the people watching this podcast are not asian you know they're they're already american you don't need that put up other inspiring things but that's just my opinion well yeah well i i think and i think it's i think what you're describing is super important and the way i think i would describe it myself is you want the environment that that the the customer you know the student the family and the parent uh, are, are experiencing to be comfortable to them and so where else do they like to spend time where do they feel good spending time not where do they go and be kind of uncomfortable and cramped in a corner but where do they like to hang out right and I, you know for, for many years i've, I've kind of taught this concept and, and certainly with my school operators uh, in my locations I'm, I'm we talk about this all the time is the martial arts school is sort of like this third place right the the fam the family has school and home or work and home depending on you know if it's the adult work and home if it's the child school and home well we want to kind of be like this third place uh, uh, schultz talks about that a lot with starbucks right and mm -hmm. so i think that's a great example a great analogy if they feel comfortable at starbucks what does starbucks look like how does it feel what, you know what is their experience like while they're there and then is that congruent or incongruent with what you're trying to accomplish you know so but but, but i think i think to drill into it i think you're onto a deeper piece of this, which is um, culture, right? So let me maybe frame this a little bit. Um, you know, I, I'm a big systems person, right? So I think we, we should have really solid systems in our martial arts school for marketing, for uh, enrollments, for teaching, for, you know, delivering our delivering classes. But one of the things I discovered, you know, studying a lot of Disney, you know, management and leadership uh, uh, courses is you know, systems and, and procedures get you so far, but culture is what fills in the gaps, right? And I think what you're describing with even the, the look and feel of the locations, the decor and, and how that looks, um, it ties into the overall culture of what the school is, right? How do they perceive what they're, how does the student perceive what you do? Is it just like home? Is it like school? Is it the, like the playground? Or is it something totally different? Is it some unique thing that helps me deliver that message? So how does all that tie together for you and, and for your school operators when you when you get to, you know, the culture of the school, the, the types of habits and behaviors that you're trying to, you know, accomplish along with what the thing looks like? Well, you know, this is a really important topic um, because a lot of us are so familiar with our martial art if we have an Asian background, uh, we're familiar with that Asian background, the language. Uh, new person comes in, they know nothing. So they can be uh, intimidated by all that. We wear different clothes. Uh, oh, they're, they're, they're bowing before they go on. The, uh, they're using words like omote gyaku. I don't know what omote gyaku means, but everybody seems to know that. Uh, you know, we can kind of shrink back from that um now that's in a you know kind of an asian oriented uh martial art i think there are a lot of americans younger much much younger than me americans running schools where no it's, it's run as an american uh operation uh, they use english uh they might have a suit that they wear um, they might have certain practices but if we can i think two things if we can number one reduce that impression on people when they first come in make it accessible um 
And this is uh, relates back to who you have greeting people. Um, you have real people making real greetings um, to individuals. So in our schools, we we borrowed from some of the uh, I don't know how you describe it. I guess more liberal fundamentalist churches in our area. And they recruit people from the church to be greeters. And, you know, they might do it for three months and uh, um, they even wear a little pin, you know. Uh, and a real person looks around and just greets everybody who comes in. So I think that's, you know, one way to start uh, a warm, cheerful person greets you so there are going to be two people who come in one somebody who's just coming in with somebody uh you know i'm bringing uh you know little becky and i'm her granddad and somebody comes up and greets me um i don't know this person they don't know me but there's are certain things we can say and uh, oh are you uh, with somebody here you know and i'll say yeah i brought becky and she's my granddaughter oh great uh, you know, and then just start a conversation like that. Or it'll be a new person. Uh, no, I just came in for some information. Uh, oh, wonderful. So you've right away found out who they are. But you've gotten over that awkward kind of thing, you know. Uh, uh, if you're the head teacher, you should know who the parents and grandparents are. But God, you got <clears throat> 250, 350 students. That, that's not reasonable. Uh, so that would be number one, uh, a warm greeter type of a person that uh, that people volunteer you don't pay them they just volunteer mm -hmm. uh, and they might just wear regular clothes uh, rather than a gi uh, that type of a thing the second thing that i think is important when people are coming in is uh, martial arts these days people are doing it for I mean, all kinds of reasons. Now, obviously, there's a fitness crowd that, hey, I'm bored at the gym. I just want to lose some weight. Uh, we don't really deal with that a lot in our school. Right. I mean, we're just, I mean, we're, we're, we're qualified. And we've tried fitness programs with very personable instructors. And our people are interested in something a little deeper. If you want to go lose weight, go to the gym, you know. Uh, and even self-defense, as obvious as that is, you know, with all the laws these days regarding self-defense and getting in fights or just carry a little shocker thing or something, <laughs> you, know, you got self-defense handled, you got fitness handled. Why are you really here? Why are you really here? So there's a deeper level of what people are experiencing. And, uh, now, I, I, I don't know. This could be my schools and the, the emphasis that I put on personal development using martial arts curriculum as a way to set up parallels for conflicts people have at home or at work or at school or wherever they go. Um, you know, so maybe I, I, you know, I shouldn't say too much about that. That may be unique to our schools. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I think, I think that, um, I think it does draw a bit of a differential in the marketplace too, right? So I think if if you're in, I hate to say only the fitness sector, but you know, if if fitness is the core benefit of your product or service, and I, I hesitate even to use the word product, but you know, let's let's put it in those terms for just a minute. What, what does the market perceive at a, at a higher level of value? Is it, you know, just losing that extra 10 pounds or is it, you know, really the ability to live a more successful life, the ability to sort of, you know, master those daily conflicts that we, de that we all deal with or having the confidence to, you know, stand up to the boss or, you know, whatever the case might be. Um, I think that there's a big differential in the marketplace there. I think, uh, frankly, I think it's kind of bad advice if, if, if the idea is to skew toward fitness when we've already sort of discovered that the market, why does the market value Harvard at a higher degree than it does community college? It's not really all that much because of the books they read, right? It's not because so much of the of the science or the, the math that they're going to be learning in Harvard. It's much more about the person you become, 
right? So I think I think I think what you're saying is exactly congruent with what we're doing and what certainly our our, our members are kind of striving for. Um, let's let's loop all that together for a second. Um, so as again, as you look at the, at your backdrop there at your home dojo, if if that's any indication of what you know the locations are like, um, we've now created this culture this. Um, this environment where students come and it's significantly different than home. And, and I love the concept of having a very smooth onboarding process where students are indoctrinated into that culture well so that it doesn't feel intimidating or overwhelming. That's that's incredibly important. And, and so many of our folks miss that, right? We think it's mm. kind of, this is the way it is and, and you know, okay, all right. But what about the you know seven-year-old who had a confidence problem coming in? Have we helped that or hurt that, right? But I think it's critically important that that you you don't, you know, diminish the difference in the culture. We want to bring people into that culture, if that makes sense. The, the, we, we want them to feel like this is different than home. We want them to feel like this is different than school. The rules here are different. The way we behave here is different. Uh, the, the, your, the expectations that we have are higher for you here, right, than they might be at, at on the playground or whatever the case might be. And I think that's one of the fundamental components in creating character change, right? They have to understand that our expectations are higher here, right? So as, as you're, you, you touched on it a little bit, um, maybe describe a little bit, how, how do you mold your curriculum in order to sort of accomplish those objectives? You talked a lot about the application of the curriculum and, and uh, your curriculum as it, as it applies to student retention and things like that. How do you deal with that? How do you solve that problem in your, in your uh, operation? Well, we are, uh, that's a great question because we really are kind of radical, um, in when I look around at martial arts schools in general, um, I think we're, we're pretty radical. We took the ninja martial art that I studied in the 1970s, how people fought in Japan in the 1500s. And there are certain principles. And over some years, I took those principles and overlaid those with modern American uh, street protection needs. So it's a very pragmatic uh, martial art. So when people come in, we have a level one, we call it level one. It lasts from eight months to a year, uh, depending on how often people come in and so forth. We have 12 fights, 12 different fights. And uh, people practice against uh, padded targets. They practice with themselves in a mirror and they practice with a training partner. And we tell them when you practice with a training partner, um, that's just for your timing. And uh, when you practice with the pads, that's for your power and speed so that we don't have injuries. But we have 12 fights and we ask cops and bouncers and even coroners you know, what are the, <laughs> you know, what are the <laughs> oh, my God. oh, Lord, and, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. And, and so the idea is I'm standing here and I'm doing some footwork, basically dealing with my hands and it could be a uh, hook punch, straight punch, uh, kick, a grab from behind, slamming up against a wall grab from beside uh, where they get you off balance. And, you know, we kind of brag that of these 12, only five you would find in an MMA ring. Um, MMA ring is very different. You know, it's two consensual athletes uh, vying with each other on the street. It's totally different. And uh, so they go through that. And I have a book, uh, The Ninja Defense, by Tuttle that has all of these 12 fights illustrated in them. And uh, of course they also learn such skills as how to hit the ground and basic striking skills and so forth. Um, they also learn a part of our, our ethics code. And uh, so there are 14 of these uh, points of ethics and they learn one for each belt that they go through. And, and they're not required to live that. They're required, required to explore it. So the first part of our ethics code would be, uh, I protect life and health. I avoid violence whenever possible. And 
we just ask people, hey, check it out. Do you know of a person who lived the other way? No, I, I rely on predator tactics and I count on violence whenever possible. What kind of life did they live? Uh, we don't require they live that way. We just require they study it and examine it. And uh, But that's our sneaky way of getting in. We're protectors, not predators. Uh, MMA, ring, uh, we have a lot of fun with predators in there. But realistically, uh, uh, you're a protector. You walk into a place, uh, you know, restaurant or a coffee shop or something. And I have this one friend, I'll call him a friend who uh, says, oh, I look around. I saw if I had to fight this guy, here's what I'd do. If I had to take that guy, I'd, you know, I said, wow, how do you get a date on Saturday night? <laughs> <laughs> we would go in and we go, okay, this is the safest place in town. I'm here. Here's how I would protect this person. Oh, here's the exit over there. Uh, it's a very different attitude. How can I help? How can I help? And that's all covered in our first part of the curriculum uh, to speed through. There's a level two where we add some footwork, um, closing in, get inside fight or pulling out and uh, repositioning. Uh, so these are the next 12 most important things to know for street self-defense. So that includes somebody getting you around the head and slinging you, uh, some throws in there, basic throws. And we usually teach a principle. Um, I'd say, well, this is why this is the ninja martial art and not, you know, jujitsu or aikijitsu. It's, it's its own unique approach. And, uh, you, you take the center, you take the center and you move a person just slightly off balance. So I say we take their balance first and then we throw them as opposed to throwing them in order to take their balance. Um, so it's a little sophisticated and takes people a little while to get it. Uh, we have a level three, which is a uh, all green and brown belt. Um, now we're getting into some of the, the, the uh, grappling where I am changing my position in relation to them changing their position and doing a technique at the same time. So it's a little challenging, a little challenging, but people have gone through the level one, they've gone through the level two, and now they're ready for this level three, and we call level four black belt. So it's very important that the curriculum, again, relies on hitting targets, uh, mirror work, uh, you know, personal work and working with a training partner. Um, and the movements themselves are not stylized. Um, we'll, we'll start out here. It's not, you know, like my tongue sudo. It was, it's, it was kind of stylized. A uh, person would punch this way and we would intercept the punch this way. Uh, People don't do that on the street. Right. And uh, yeah, so it's uh, me shifting, cutting over. Uh, it's very pragmatic. And I think that appeals to people. They can do it. Like on their first lesson, they can take home something that night. No, I can really do this. Uh, maybe I'll do it better tomorrow, do it better in three months, but I can at least access this. And uh, so I'm a... Uh, kind of outspoken advocate of, okay, who are the people studying with you? And as you indicated, what are they expecting to get for this you know, pricey service? And how do they feel when they leave your place every night? Um, very important, very important. Um, We've got to give them something they can relate to and they can do. And it looks like what they see on YouTube. You know, I mean, when we were starting out, you know, there were a couple of guys who'd say, oh, this is what happens in a real fight. And, you know, you'd, you'd hear this kind of stuff. But now with YouTube, you just type in, you know, street scrap or uh, whatever. Oh, man, just you can spend the whole evening just watching these. Everybody, you know takes with their cell phone and uh, uh, so use that use that um, provide 
instruction in how to handle those kind of attacks. Uh, people enjoy that. Um, it seems realistic. Uh, last thing I'll say is that also a person who's paying a, uh, you know, uh, what, what I call a reasonable price for their martial art, they're busy. They're not just like hanging around the apartment at night wondering what to do. No, they are busy. They got the kids there schlepping around different places. They got uh, clients to meet. Uh, they've got, you know, their country club they're going to. They've got, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of things. And, and martial arts becomes like one piece of this mosaic that is their life. Now, this is different from me. This is all I do. Right. All I do, you know, I, I live this and I love it. And, you know, I'm 70 years old. I'll, I'll be 70 years old in, the, in uh, this year. And I'm already worried, man, I only got 30 more years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to run out of uh, lifetime before I run out of lessons. But I'm weird. I'm weird. Uh, I'm not running a school for a guy like me. I'm running a guy. So I get him a couple hours a week. Uh, I've got to make that time truly uplifting like nowhere else. I had a couple of people say to me over the year, you know, it's kind of scandalous to say this, but they say, you know, this is more spiritually uplifting than church, <laughs> you know? And if you run things that way, uh, uh, it's that personal. It's, it's that real, um, That, that's what it takes. That's what it takes. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot to unpack there. But if done well, what you just said, I think it is really the experience all of our clients should be having. Because unlike formalized you know, religion, and again, this might be, this might go down the path a little further than we need to. But, but, you know, we have something that they don't, which is we have the ability to engage the body at a higher level, right? We have the ability to, you know, when, when you're training, when you're working out, when you're moving, a lot of chemical reactions, serotonin, a lot of things happen in your brain that create a much more real scenario. So we have the ability to affect the type of character change, if we want to call it that, uh, affect the type of personality change, affect the type of character, you know, improvement that unfortunately sitting in the pew doesn't, you know, really stimulate the same type of energy and the same type of thing. So I, I, I think we have that, we have that club in our bag, so to speak. I think we should use it. So, so there's a ton to unpack there, sir. I, I think, let me, let me underscore one thing that you mentioned, and, and maybe there's something that we should expand on there. Um, since your curriculum is for lack of a better description, more street relevant than it is, you know, Tong Sudo, than it is traditional. Uh, and again, I, I watch, uh, you know, a bunch of those YouTube videos myself, and I've never seen anybody, you know, defend against the, you know, the inbound punch with the high block. So maybe there's a lesson there. Um, but since that's the case in your specific curriculum, how would you say, uh, how how would you say that you focus on translating those lessons to, you know, the younger student, the, ch the you know the children in your school and and the younger student in a sort of a, uh, uh, because l let me frame this, you're not one of them, but there are plenty of folks in our industry, unfortunately, who think that this is what really works in a fight. Therefore, this is exactly what I'm going to teach. And I'm going to teach it the same way I learned it in 1971. And I don't, and I was 27 years old and you're seven, but I'm teaching you the same way I learned when I was 27. And right. And, and I know you, and I know your schools and I know your curriculum and, and you're very much not that. So how, how would you, how do you square that particular circle? If you're teaching this type of uh, radical curriculum, this type of curriculum that's much more applicable on the street, how do you translate that to the younger audience? Well, that is a very awkward question. Because <laughs> like in my Dayton school, we're located in Centerville, Ohio. You know, I mean, it is middle class, upper middle class. Um, nobody gets in fights. Kids don't get in fights. Um, uh, this is all abstract to them. Um, and yet it's a very pragmatic self-defense system. Oh man, how do we approach youth? Uh, sometimes my wife Rumiko will comment, oh gosh, I wish we were teaching Tang Soo Do. <laughs> It'd be easier, you know? Uh, you, this is the upper block, this is the punch. Uh, um, 
But what we do is we have uh, created exercises where we have to be so careful. You know, you take a nine-year-old and uh, you don't want to scare them, you know. Um, but you, you do know more than they do. And they're going to be driving in a couple of years and they're going to be out on their own in a couple of years and they could be victimized. Uh, they could go away to college and, uh, uh, you know, go to a party and uh, could be victimized. And uh, so we're really training the way the person thinks, you know, because a young woman goes to her first fraternity party and, you know, uh, she thinks she's all grown up and, you know, she's 18 and, uh, she's probably not going to get in a fist fight with some guy, but, you know, quite, you know, things are going to be offered, let's say. And, uh, for her to be confident enough in herself and know, and, eh, no, this is of more benefit to you than it is to me. Uh, no, thank you. That's a major thing, you know? So we can emphasize the, that kind of thinking. Um, a person is coming in and we might say to the kids, this kid gets mad. They run out of words. They don't know what to say because you're smarter than they are. So they, uh, 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 yeah. they, oh, okay. Um, you are positioning to the side. You can guide them away and get out of there. Um, we can suggest, now we have a, a series of, what we call four elements, earth, water, fire, and wind that come from the ninja tradition. And so earth is holding your ground. And some people are just naturally that way. If they get in a conflict or confrontation, uh, they just hold their ground. No, 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 no. Hold it, hold it. Oh, stop, stop. You know, you know. Uh, they want things to go back to where it was before the conflict started. So holding your ground. And uh, then there's water which is being overwhelmed. And so I tactically position myself. The person comes in, I can't hold my grounds. I tactically position myself. So we would say, you know, if you had to <laughs> fight a shark in the ocean, you know, would you punch him in the teeth or would you like sneak over here and hit him in the gills, you know, uh, tactically positioning. And then there's fire, which is interrupting and wind, which is evading. So these principles we use uh, and we're constantly emphasizing to kids, hey, you're little, you know, that's your fault. <laughs> what if a big guy, kid comes and pushes you around or somebody tries to grab you? Hey, kid, come on over here. Uh, now, this is like from six or seven on up. We have a very different program for like four or five and six year olds. Sure. Um, there we use a lot of obstacle courses. We use like bright colored pool noodles so they don't look threatening, but we use them like swords and kids have to get out of the way and we try and wrap that around their head. Oh, they, they get away from that. And so it's a lot of fun and a lot of giggling. And, uh, but every now and then, oh, 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 get in line. Let's, let's, let's you know, do this right. And uh, so the little teeny kids is a different program than the, uh, than the youth. And I'll be honest, um, I'm looking for more ways to relate to kids with what we have. It's so pragmatic, and yet kids don't see violence in the school. I'm thinking where they do run into violence is keyboard stuff, you know. Yeah. Cyberbullying, that's a big deal. You know, a little kid is forming their own identity and they're cheerfully reaching out to their friends and getting that kind of feedback. And mom tells them she loves them. Well, that's just mom, you know. Dad says, I'm proud of you. Ah, it's just dad. I want feedback, positive feedback from my friends at school. And then it goes haywire and somebody's. So I, I think that would be a challenge that we're going to develop now some ways of some some techniques some techniques for cyberbullying so here's the technique but secretly the technique transmits a state of mind you know we have to teach these kids 
you know, who you are, the value you provide, the gift you are. Uh, so when they come up against this, uh, you know, inevitable onslaught, they can believe in themselves. They can believe that they have a value and, and we have to teach them some tricks. We teach them some, some ways of dealing with that. Oh, I've got my tricks. I call them tricks. Um, you could call them techniques or methods or whatever, but I call them tricks. Uh, this is how I deal with it. I learned this at the martial arts school. I did this. Um, it got the response from the person that my teacher told me they would. They'll, they'll, they'll be so stunned. They'll laugh and they'll try to call you a name or something like that. But no, no, that means you got under their skin. You won. You won, and uh, you know. So I think we're going to work on developing uh, some of those uh, aspects uh, as we go into the future. Yeah, su super interesting, right? It's it's certainly a, a, a an incredibly as we live more and more and more of our life on the cell phone and on social, it's becoming you know such a big part of our lives. And I think uh, from a, the futurist in me standpoint, when we look at self-driving cars and things like that, we're going to be, we, we collectively, especially us, you know, old enough to drive, we're going to be spending more time on social, not less over the next 20 years. Right. I mean, this is, this is a, this is the beginning of this thing. I, I believe, I don't think it's the end of this thing. I think we're just at the beginning of this deal. Oh yeah. And, and I think what's very important for martial artists is if somebody's got a school, if they're that good, that they can teach other people that means they got to be teaching they got to be studying for like at least 10 years or something like that this never existed yeah. this was not part of what they were training if you're like me going back to the 60s no we didn't have cell phones back in the 60s uh there was no keyboard there was no cyber bullying so if i'm just teaching what i learned in the 60s in 2018 2019 it's, it's woefully inadequate and, and, I, and I say it would be like, you know, Harvard Law School bragging that, oh, yes, we teach the best 1947 <laughs> law that you can learn. And uh, I, I don't want to learn 1947 law. I want to learn 2021 law. You know, um, that's what I want to learn. And why are we so different in the, the martial arts? Yeah, I think that's right. I, I think, you know, I think that's right. We, 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 we're, we've been given this gift and the gift of our tradition and the gift, the gift of our tradition, in my view, is the culture that we can create. And that culture is, is one of the, in my view, one of the most impactful environments for transformational change that exists, right? I mean, if you go to Tony Robbins or, if, you know, whatever, I mean, any of these types of experiences, West Point, Harvard, whatever the case might be, uh, the parallels with what we what we do and what we can do in martial arts are so deep. It, it's incredible. And so we've been given that gift, but let's not squander that gift and remain so ardently, uh, you know, ignorantly, you know, connected to the you know, what the tradition was that we don't evolve. Right. And, and I mean, you know, you're, you're looking at cyber you know, after 51 ish years in martial arts, uh, I think that's a testament to why you've been able to accomplish what you have is it, we're always learning. We're always innovating and trying to find out what the solution to the next thing is. Um, on that topic, by the way, if anyone is, is interested in um, sort of looking at some of the things that you're doing from a curriculum standpoint and sort of developing themselves with this uh, ninja art, um, there's, you have a site ninjaselfdefense.com that uh, people can actually subscribe to and they can get lessons and things like that uh, over the internet and sort of study what you're teaching. So I think that's very useful, very interesting for folks to, to you know, sort of experience. I think the third thing that you said, by the way, to unpack was, um, and, and I thought the shark story is hysterical. I think that's perfect, right? Because that's super visual for kids. They're totally going to understand that. They're totally, that's totally going to make sense to them. And, and the idea that you are in fact translating those lessons to that market is the big lesson there, right? I mean, the big lesson is it's not just block punch. It's not just, you know, block punch kick. It's how do we tell a story or put that student through some level of impact that they're actually going to retain this information. They're actually going to, this is something that that's going to stick with them. That's going to change their life and, you know, for, for the future. And, and the, I think the other part that you said was you're putting them through these experiences ahead of time. Right. So I've already experienced someone swinging the noodle at me. I've already experienced someone, you know, shaking me up from the back or whatever the case is. So I now know how to respond to it. I've been in that experience 
you know, 250 times, uh, not for, not afraid of this anymore, right? This is no big deal. This is, a, you know, I've done this enough times that it's now muscle memory. So I think, I think that's intrinsic in what we do. And I think it's very important that you're, um, uh, that you're reinforcing that part. Um, you just to kind of loop back again, I know, I know we're quickly running out of time, so I want to be respectful of that. Um, you talked, we've been talking a fair amount about culture and how that sort of fills in the gaps. And you've described to me, um, you've already described today the, the 14 point ethics code, uh, and the four elements that you're working, that you used it as, as teaching me mechanisms. Um, but you'd also describe to me, uh, you have this six point hero code and eight keys to personal development. Um, can you maybe kind of walk me through that? Like, like how does, what role does that play in developing students? And I know those are tools for your instructors to use to teach those lessons. How, how do you, how do you implement all that? And, and what was the, the, the catalyst for all that? And, uh, how does that help your, your team? Well, you know, uh, uh, very briefly, uh, we, when people come in as white belts, they have uh, a three-part student code or student creed. And, you know, when we tell them right up front, these are going to be the three things you should check out whenever you're doing anything dangerous. You know, a ski jump or a bungee jump or jump in a cage with a tiger or you know, <laughs> Martial art lessons, anything that's dangerous. Number one, I believe in myself. I'm confident I can accomplish my goals. And people memorize that, you know, and you say, well, have you ever had a day when you didn't believe in yourself? Yeah, well, say it twice on that day. <laughs> if you have a right to believe in yourself, uh, my potential. Uh, I look at something and, oh, man, I can't do that. I, no way I can do that. Then I'm not going to be motivated to try it. And no matter how much my teacher you know, tries to coach me. I've already decided I can't do that. So no, I believe in myself. I can do this. Uh, number two, uh, I believe in what I study. I'm disciplined. I'm ready to learn in advance. And again, if I don't believe I can do this, and we ask people, hey, have you ever done anything like a job or a relationship or whatever, and you just didn't believe in it, you know, and some hands go up and why did you do it? Well, I had the money or I was scared that I couldn't uh, find another way or what? Oh, okay. Fear. So no, uh, legitimately believe. And the third is, uh, uh, I believe in my teachers. I show respect for all who helped me progress. Now that includes negative teachers too. Did you ever learn anything positive from a negative relationship? Oh God, everybody says yes. So those are the three things that we start with. Um, and we, we say, if you don't believe in yourself and you haven't studied how to do it and you don't have a good coach, you're crazy just to go in there. The only time you would ever do that would be a sporting event. Um, mediocre at tennis, but I think I'll take on this person and, you know, I might learn. Uh, you're not going to die if you come in second place, you know. And uh, then we have a 14-point code of mindful action, we call it, where it's our ethics code. And for each belt, they learn one of these 14 point codes uh, of how to behave. And I joking, they say, well, you know, at worst, this is just how to stay out of jail. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know we're not predators. Uh, we don't steal. We don't lie. We don't sexually, you know, abuse people. I know we have a lot of kids in our school, so we don't refer to sexuality. But, you know, we say, I cultivate positive relationships. Uh, I avoid harming others for selfish gain. And the little kid says, what's that mean? So you don't use other people. If you ever notice anybody who used somebody, they'd pretend to be their friend and they'd get something from them. We don't do that. Oh, okay. And with the adults, we can, you know, make the reference. Uh, I don't know whether I should say this or not, but all, all this stuff comes from Buddhism. Sure. Uh, but we just changed the wording a little bit. So it sounds like a corporate self-development <laughs> uh, thing. And then when they get their black belt and going for second degree, we have eight points of personal development. Now, this is where we look at ourselves, the way we think. There is a mechanical way that every one of us thinks. And there's maybe a better way, a more effective, efficient way. You learn to think when you were two and three and four, and now you're 26. Do you think you could upgrade that a little bit? Uh, the way we speak, uh, we use language. Um, I had a young guy working for me and uh, 
he would say, uh, uh, somebody thank him. He'd go, oh, no problem. And so I just said to him, you know, that's cool among your social peers, but older people don't like to hear no problem. I'm not a problem. I'm the customer. You know? <laughs> and so I said, uh, you know, just say something. Uh, and so, oh, okay. He said, I'll do that. So I don't know, a couple of weeks later, I overheard him. You know, the person said, thank you. And he says, oh, it's my pleasure. And I said, whoa, that was amazing. Uh, you know, and he goes, well, you told me to say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, you're paying attention. So just the way we use our language uh, and how we dress, how we appear, you know, I mean, I'm, I look the way I look. Uh, I've looked this way since 1967. <laughs> 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 beard was darker and I had more hair up here, but, uh, but you know, there are some funny looks, um, you know, people with weirdly shaped beards and, you know, funny shaved, half shaved heads with little sprouts of hair. And I mean, express yourself, do what works for you, but bear in mind the people who are coming into you have a certain expectation of what they're looking for. And, you know, you could just, your appearance could put, some people ill at ease. And so I'm just saying, consider that. And then going for third degree, there's a six point hero code, um, six specific things that people look at that makes for heroic living. And if one of those is missing, it's not heroic. And, uh, you know, this is very interesting to people, especially this day when we talk about, you know, a basketball player being a hero. Uh, uh, no, I just play basketball well. Um, I make a lot of money and I express my opinions and people listen to my opinion. Not a hero. Uh, he's just, a, you know, a fortunate genetic example. Uh, no, there's six ways to actually be a hero. Uh, and as I said, I kind of borrowed this from Buddhism the wonderful thing about Buddhism is you don't have to believe in anything. This <laughs> you know, stuff just works, you know, whereas <laughs> to be a good Christian or a good uh, Muslim, you have to believe and stay to belief. Buddhism is easy going with that kind of stuff. So we just import all of that. And I'll just say this to wrap up. You know, it's very interesting when I talk with our successful adults who are involved in the program and I say, you know, hey, what, what's something you use this past week? Uh, can uh, can you really relate to this? They always bring up the code and the creed, and because this is the conflicts that successful people are having. They're not in dangerous parts of town. They're not robbed at knife point. Uh, they run into the office bully. They run into a superior who doesn't know how to lead, and it's just you know. Uh, and they use these tactics that they learned at the martial arts school uh to bend things around to work for them and i think hey i'm not gonna argue with that let's 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 go with that uh people are learning things at the martial arts school they're using them in their real life and they're generating the results that they want to get and they come back and thank us for it uh keep that in there keep that in there yeah that's a win right yeah that that's i think yeah uh, again there's like so much to unpack here but but i think i think i think what you're describing is exactly what i think it's so important for us as an industry to stay focused on which is this idea that you know the physical part of what we deliver is great it's wonderful right i, I mean one student in your entire career ever gets in a scrape and saves their own life then what we've done is worth it Right. I mean, even if it's not even one student, right? Right. But but I mean that that's absolutely a huge component of, of martial arts. It's a huge component of self-defense. It's a huge component of what we do. But I think you've described it this way. There are these higher lessons, right? And these higher lessons, e even though for us it might seem not as intuitive, right? It might seem like it's somewhat buried in like the bunkai, right? Like, like it's sort of a hidden sort of message in, inside the, the technique or whatever it is. It, this is really what the market is telling us all over the place that it really wants. Now, it's hard to understand that. It's hard for them to articulate that when they first walk in the door. Absolutely. Most, right? Is, is that your experience? Most of the time when they walk in the door, they... they 
almost nobody walks in the door and says, yep, I, I was going to go to Tony Robbins and give him $50,000 to you know fix my head. But instead, I decided to come to the martial arts school. That's mostly not what they're saying. Mostly what they're saying is, hey, yeah, listen, you know, I've got this extra 15 pounds and I really want to do something about that. Or my you know, son Johnny's being bullied in school a little bit. I want to make sure he can defend himself if he had to. Or my my daughter's having a little bit of trouble focusing in, in, in third grade. And you know, I heard that this is good for that. That's how they articulate it. But the meaning behind those questions, the meaning behind those things are, are these, these higher lessons. And I think you've, you've described them as, as life mastery, if, if that makes sense. Does that sound right to you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We can you know, teach tricks. Again, I use that word tricks. We can teach tricks um, to kids, you know, like their little workbook. They're reading through the workbook and they're not comprehending. And so the parent says, well, read slower or read it three times. And you know, I always, I'm, I always say, always ask the laziest, cheapest person how to get something done. They'll come up with the best <laughs> one. So I, lazy and cheap, you know? So I said, no, go to the back. They always, they always have a, a questions in the back of the chapter, read those questions and now read the chapter and, you know, just, you know what to look for. So, oh, wow. Yeah, I could do that. Yeah, yeah. It's just easy and cheap you know, way to do that. So there's a trick. But what we are doing very subtly, you know, very subtly is affecting their, their actual character, who they are. We're opening up their potential. Um, and at the deepest level, you know, we're altering who they are, what they're, they're changing as a human being. They are changing as a human being. And, you know, we might even ask them, you know, the adults said, hey, you know, we're requiring you to change as a human being in here. Is that, is that okay? And people go, uh, is that like, like, you know, office bully is deviling you and uh, you now see where they're coming from and understand this is a tactic that works for them, but I'm above that. And you can counter that and it almost amuses you. I mean, would that be okay if, 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 if you were like that? Oh God, yeah, yeah. And, you know, some knucklehead that cuts in front of you in traffic and, uh, uh, you know, you used to get mad, but now, uh, you know, it's just a poor knucklehead who didn't allow himself enough time to get somewhere. I'm above that. Would it would it be okay if you didn't like respond in anger? Uh, oh God, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so we we kind of, but that's really what we're looking at, and we tell people right up front, no, 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 you are changing as a human being through your martial art training. You're 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 bigger now. You're expanding. Um, your capabilities, your possibilities. You're not three anymore. You're 28, you're 42. Uh, uh, people are happy with that. Yeah. The, the, I mean, it's exactly, I, I believe it's exactly right. And again, to sort of loop back to sort of the capitalist uh, in me, it's <laughs> that also the market is, will tell you, will tell us that they value those lessons at a much higher level than they do just the self-defense lesson or just the weight loss lesson or just the whatever. Because, you know, if, if the, uh, if the mom of the nine-year-old came in and, and her reason for coming in was the extra 15 pounds, uh, that's great. We can certainly help that. But, you know, truthfully, why haven't you solved that already? Right now, we're not going to articulate it in that way, but but there's a reason, right? And that's usually a deeper reason. And I, I like your your description of that. The higher lessons I think are critically important. So, by the way, uh, by the way, as you described earlier, Harvard tuition this year is sixty four thousand five hundred and thirty dollars uh, a year. Uh, West Point, uh, you know, obviously they don't charge tuition, but let's say it's analogous to sixty four thousand dollars a year. Um, and and if you were to look at the lessons that you just described in the outline in which you described it, this is exactly parallel to the way West Point operates, exactly parallel to the way Harvard University the, you know, operates. Uh, I've spent a lot of time studying and, and, and learning, the, learning how those organizations and operations structure their curriculum, how they structure their lessons, how they structure their leadership skills development and things like that. And what you're describing is, is you know, there's a big equal sign, exactly parallel. 
to how they're doing it. And and we're doing these types of things as you're describing for the four to 94 year old. So the, that's why the marketplace can value what we do at such a high level. And, and I think it's our mission to figure out how we can, you know, e- equal Harvard's tuition. You know, how do we figure out how to make it a $64,000 a year program? I mean, I mean, that's, you know, that's where we, that's what we're doing, you know? Uh, and if we can just articulate 20% of that, then certainly, you know, we, we as an industry would be doing a lot better than, than we currently are. Uh, we'd have a lot more folks like you that have 30 locations and, you know, uh, uh, have lived this martial arts lifestyle for 51 years and, and, uh, uh, have another 30 to go. Right. So, uh, I think that's, I think that's our collective mission. So I, I really appreciate the time you spent with us today. Thank you so much again. Um, and any final higher lesson that you might think would be useful to sign off with? We, 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 we've covered so much territory today. Oh yeah. Um, one thing I emphasize to my teachers over and over again is uh, you know, like a little twofold thing. Number one, people come in and you're the teacher. Um, they expect, at least on the floor, for you to command yourself with some dignity and some higher vision. And when you're 28 years old running a martial arts school or 33, you know, that can be a little intimidating. Uh, so but put your head in that place. What does this person expect? I'm not their buddy. You know, I'm not just a cool guy. They know Uh, I'm, I am wisdom. Now you can't like lie or fake it, but bear in mind, how am I behaving on the, am I an inspiring person? And the second thing I'll mention is uh, when it comes to teaching, Fewer words that really mean something uh, are, I see so many people over teaching, you know. And so we have a saying, if the person has enough time, if the student has enough time to get all their weight onto one leg, you're talking too much. (laughs) (laughs) A little short lesson. Uh, I had a friend who said, uh, oh, we have a rule in our school. For every degree of black belt you are, you get one sentence. (laughs) <laughs> nice. So third degree, you know, he can go for three sentences. He has a lot more to teach uh, than a uh, first degree. So those would be two things. Can you know comport yourself with a, a friendly, open, natural dignity, and uh, probably tending to overteach. Uh, just give them bare minimums. Give them a big grin. Let's see how it goes, and let the people learn the lesson through their body uh, rather than through listening to you. Yeah. Yeah. M- most, yeah. Most times when you find yourself over explaining, it's because you haven't planned the class well enough. And you don't know <laughs> what the next, you, you know, the teacher doesn't know what the next exercise drill slash component of the class is supposed to be. So they're actually being lazy. So I, I, I have exactly the same, my, my rule, uh, I'm, I'm just from my own experience, my rule is nobody walks onto the floor, no instructor, my staff, like my team, right? Nobody walks onto the floor without the class plan. Right. And that includes me. So if I jump in to teach a class, I paste my class planner on the board in the front. and Everybody knows what I'm doing. All the, all the assistant instructors know what's going to happen at seven minutes past the hour. All the, you know, you know what I'm trying to say? So it's just a matter of that sort of that executive level of leadership, right? Like, like, right. Oh, absolutely. We've got a big book, you know, Hey, it's third week of October. Here's how we do it. Yeah. You know, we allow the people to interpret it their own way, that creativity, but no, nope, we're all teaching the same thing with, yes, I'm totally on board with you on that. Yeah. We're, we're fellows of the same cloth there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and, and I think, th- I think it all ties back into, I don't know if this is the core concept for our time today, but certainly it, it we, we've hit on this same message, I think th- three or four times. I think we both believe that we have the opportunity and perhaps even the responsibility to raise the level of our standards in our industry. And certainly for the typical martial arts school to be able to raise your expectations of yourself, raise your expectations of your team, raise your, raise the expectations that you have for your business. Um, I think all of those things require uh, congruence right? So therefore, if I expect more, I better be delivering more. And if I expect more in, in 
let's say, uh, loyalty for my students. I better be delivering more of what they're expecting, right? And if I expect more tuition, then I better be delivering more than what uh, you know I'm expecting. And if I'm expecting better leadership skills from my team, I better be exhibiting better <laughs> leadership skills for my team. So I, I, I think that that idea of of raising the standards of our culture and, and what we do are, are critically important to us in, in, as an industry. And I think it, if you hold yourself to a higher standard, you're then able to hold other people to higher standards and they're never going to do like better than you expect. Right. They're almost always going to try, you know, go just up to what you expect. So the higher <laughs> you raise those expectations, the higher it raises their performance. So, uh, uh, you know, I think that that, that sort of maybe underscores our time together today. Uh, sir, thank you again so much. I really appreciate it. This has been fantastic. I know, um, um, all of our people, our AMS members and folks who, who are, uh, who are watching, uh, I'm sure you've got, I've got, I don't know, I don't know, a couple of pages of notes here that I'm going to go back and, uh, uh, do some work on. So, uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you again so much, sir. And I uh, appreciate the time. Great. Wonderful talking with you today, Toby. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody else for watching again. Um, as I've described too many times before, uh, it's critically important that you do take this time out of your schedule every day, every week, whatever the case might be, to focus on big picture, to focus on strategy, uh, focus on the implementation of these business strategies in your martial arts school. Uh, the product that we provide in the industry is so valuable. The market is telling us that they want it. It's, it, it's crying for it but we have to be able to match our message, right? We have to be able to match what we're uh, delivering and, and with, with what their expectations are. So it's critically important that you're taking this time out of your day to work on your business, not just working in your business. So I appreciate that. I respect that time that you spent with us. So thank you again so much and we'll speak again soon. Thanks everybody. Now I'm gonna hit stop here.